This play is called Our Town. It was written by Thornton Wilder and is produced for you this evening by the Steeple Players. In it, you will see Miss Rubin, Mrs. Smith, and Miss Broderson Churico, and all these other people that you see before you. Now before we start our story this evening, there are a few details that I would like to cover with each of you. First of all, your fine state has asked me to make you aware of the emergency exits here in the building. At the rear of the building, you'd want to go right back out those doors and over to the safety of the green. Not that there will be an emergency. This building's been standing an awfully long time. Second of all, if any of you brought a lozenge along with you this evening, if you could kindly unwrap it now, I'm sure our storytellers would be much obliged. Finally, it has come to my attention that many of you in the audience may be carrying telephones in your pockets. Remarkable. <laughs> I can only imagine, however, how distracting that might be to our storytellers. So if you could kindly notify your operators that you're otherwise engaged for the next couple of hours, we would be ever so much obliged. Last, I'd like to thank the clergy and the congregation for allowing us to use this beautiful space to tell our story this evening. And now for our story. Grover's Corners lies just over the Massachusetts border. Grover's Corners, New Hampshire. Latitude, 37 degrees, 34 minutes. Longitude, 42 degrees, 74 minutes. The first act shows a day in our town. The date, May 7th, 1901. Just before dawn, Ah, yeah, just about. The first streaks of light are beginning to show in back of our mountain over there. The morning star always gets wonderful bright the minute before it has to go, doesn't it? Well, now I'll tell you how our town lies. Up there is Main Street, and cutting across it on the left over there are the railroad tracks, and across the tracks, is Polish town. You know, foreign people who've come here to work in our mill. And um, a couple of Canuck families and the Catholic Church. The Congregational Church is right over there and next to it is the Presbyterian and the Methodist. And the Unitarian is across the street. The Baptist is down in the hollow by the river. <laughs> The town hall is right up there, and next to it is the post office. Uh, the jail's in the basement of the town hall, and William Jennings Bryan once made a speech from those steps. <sighs> well, all along Main Street, there's a row of stores with horse blocks and hitching posts in front of them. First automobile is going to come along in about five years. Belong to Banker Cartwright. He's our town's richest citizen. He lives in that big white house up there on the hill. Hmm. Well, also on Main Street, we have Morgan's Drug Store and the grocery. Just about everybody in town manages to look into those stores once a day. And this, this is our doctor's house. Doc Gibbs. This is his back door, and here's a fence for those of you that feel you need a little scenery. And here's Mrs. Gibbs, Mrs. Gibbs' garden. Corn, peas, beans, hollyhock, and heliotrope. Mm. And a lot of burdock. Mm. In those days, our newspaper came out twice a week. The Grover's Corner Sentinel. And this is Editor Webb's house. And this is 
is Mrs. Webb's garden. Just like Mrs. Gibbs' garden, only she's got a lot of sunflowers, too. They're right here. And over here, this is a big butternut tree. It's a nice town. You know what I mean? Nobody very remarkable has ever come out of it so far as we know. The earliest dates up there in the cemetery on the tombstone say 1670. There are Grovers and Cartwrights and Gibbses. Same names as around here now. Well, as I said, it's early morning. And the only lights on in town are coming from a cottage over there in Polish town where a young Polish mother has just had twins. And over in the Joe Crowell house where Joe Jr. is getting ready to deliver the morning papers. And down in the depot where Shorty Hawkins is just flagged the 510 from Boston. Ah, yeah. There it is. Of course, naturally, out in the country, all around, there have been lights on for some time now, what with milking and so on, but town folk, they sleep late. So another day has begun, and there's Doc Gibbs coming down Main Street, coming back from that baby case. And there's Mrs. Gibbs. She's coming down to make her breakfast. Doc Gibbs died in 1930. We named our new hospital after him. Mrs. Gibbs, she died a long time before, though. See, she'd gone out to visit her daughter, Rebecca, out in Canton, Ohio. Rebecca had married an insurance man, and Mrs. Gibbs had gone out to visit her, and she died there. <sighs> Pneumonia. But her body was brought back here, and she's buried up there in the cemetery with a whole mess of Cartwrights and Gibbses and Herseys. See, she was Julia Hersey before she married Doc Gibbs over in the Congregational Church. In our town, we like to know the facts about everybody. Here's Mrs. Webb. She's coming down to make her breakfast, too. Ah, yeah. And there's Doc Gibbs. He got the call to go to Polish Town at half past one this morning. And there's Joe Crowell delivering the morning paper. Morning, Doc. Morning, Joe. You like the paper now, Doc? Yes, I'll take it. Anybody been sick, Doc? No, a pair of twins over in Polish Town. Joe says here teaching Miss Foster's going to get married. Yes, sir, to a feller over in Concord. I declare, how do you boys feel about that? Well, it ain't none of my business, but I think if a person starts out a teacher, they ought to stay one. <laughs> how's your need, Joe? Oh, it's fine. I hardly even think about it anymore. But just like you told me, it always says when it's going to rain. I meant to tell you today. Going to rain? No, sir. Sure? Yes, sir. Do you ever make a mistake? No, sir. <laughs> I want to tell you something about the boy, Joe Crowell. Joe was awful bright, graduated from our high school head of his class. Got a full scholarship to Boston Technical, MIT as it's called now. Full scholarship to MIT. Graduated head of his class from there too. It was all written up in the Boston papers going to be a great engineer, Joe was. And then the war broke out. And Joe died in France. Yes, sir. All that education for nothing. What business he had picking a quarrel with the Germans, we can't make it out to this day. But it all made perfect sense to us at the time. 
Get in, Bessie. What's the matter with you? Here comes Howie Newsome, delivering the milk. Morning, Doc. Morning, Howie. Somebody sick? No, pair of twins over to Mrs. Gorshlowski's. Twins, eh? Town's getting bigger at the end. What do you think, Howie? Gonna rain? No, no, fine day. It'll burn through. <laughs> Hello, Bessie. How old is she, Howie? Going on 17. Bessie's all mixed up about the roots as the Lockhart stopped taking a quart of milk every day. She wants to leave him one just the same. Keeps scolding me the whole trip. Well, good morning, Howie. Good morning, Miss Gibbs. Doc's just coming down the street. Is he? You're a little late today. Yeah, something wrong with the separator. I don't know what it was. Children! Howie. Children! All right. Yes, yes. Easy as kittens. Oh, well, sit down and bacon will be ready in a moment. You can get a couple hours sleep this morning, can't you? Well, Mrs. Wentworth's going over to Levin. I guess I know it's about two. Her stomach ain't what it ought to be. All told, you won't get more than three hours sleep. By Frank Gibbs, I don't know what's going to become of you. I do wish you would get away somewhere. Take a proper rest. It'll do you some good. Children, time to get up. Emily, we need got to talk to George. I don't know what's come over him lately. Seems like something's on his mind. I can't even get him to chop me some wood. Hmm. Is he sassy to you? Oh, no. He just whines. Sometimes he talks about this, this baseball all the time. And <sighs> George! Rebecca! You're going to be late for school! George, look sharp. That's don't you hear your mother calling you? Winnie, you'll be late for school. Well, I guess I'll go to my office and take 40 winks. Good idea. Winnie, wash yourself good or I'll come up and do it myself. Mama, what dress shall I wear? Oh, now hush up with you. Your father's been out all night and he needs his rest. I washed an eye at the brown gingham for you special. Oh, Ma, I hate that dress. Oh, now, Rebecca. Every day I go to school dressed like, like a sick turkey. Rebecca. Now, I won't have it. Breakfast is just as good as any other meal, and I won't have you gobbling like a wolf. It'll stunt your growth. That's a fact. Now, put away that book. Oh, Ma, it's in the back again all about Canada. You know the rules well as I do. No books at table. As for me, I'd rather have my children healthy than bright. I'm both, Mama. You know I am. I'm the brightest girl in school for my age, and I have a wonderful memory. Eat your breakfast. <laughs> I will speak to your father about it after he's rested. But it seems to me that 25 cents a week is enough for a boy your age. Oh, Ma, I got a lot of things to buy. Ah, strawberry phosphate. That's what you spend it on. I don't see how Rebecca comes to have so much money. She has more than dollars. I've been saving it up for gradual. Well, it seems to me, dear, that you should spend some every now and then. Mama, do you know what I love most in the world? Do you? What? Money. Eat your breakfast. Here's the school bell. I gotta go. Now you tell Miss Foster that I sent her my best congratulations. Can you remember that? Yes, Ma. Now walk fast, but don't you run. Winnie, fit your dress. Now remember, you look 